Destined to become either the underboss or the boss of the Colombo family in New York, Michael Franzis made a decision, a decision that transformed his life, made him a brand new man, but it also has kept him alive today to tell his story. Michael, welcome to 100 Holly Street. Thanks, Rob. Great to be here. Michael, you grew up in New York where there were five organized crime families, and your dad, Sonny Franzese, was the notorious underboss for the Colombo family. So tell me, what was it like for Michael growing up in a home like that? Well, certainly different than uh, most people because my dad um, was very, very high profile. He was always a major target of law enforcement. And we grew up in an era where law enforcement wanted you to know when they were investigating you. And my dad was under investigation from probably seven or eight different agencies. And everyone would have a car parked around my house 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they had us cornered on all sides. Whenever we would leave to go anywhere, we had a parade of law enforcement vehicles following us. So I grew up in that atmosphere. And uh, I grew up, honestly, um, really hating law enforcement, hating the police, hating the government, because I loved my dad, I idolized him, and I saw them as the enemy as a kid. But you also say, Michael, that growing up, you believed that what was good was bad, and what was bad was good. Explain that. Well, you know, I, I had, uh, like I said, I loved my dad, and I couldn't, in my view, see him doing anything wrong, because he was a great father, a great husband to my mother. So um, what I didn't realize, even when I myself got involved in that life, that, you know, we were actually the bad guys and law enforcement were the good guys. But you grow up with this distorted sense of view. Because my dad told me when I was younger, you know, he said, I never want you to believe, be a police officer. And I would say, yeah, I get that, Dad. He said, no, you don't understand. Police officers take a, an oath to arrest their own parents if they were to do something wrong. He said, how could you respect anybody like that? So he put that in my head, even though he taught me to respect the law because he didn't want me to get in trouble back then. So it was kind of, you know, kind of different. But, um, you know, so I thought everything he did was good. And I thought the life that he was involved in as I got older and understood it, I thought it was honorable because I viewed my dad as an honorable guy, a guy with integrity. And so I thought anything that he was a part of had to be good. Now, your your life can be defined by two blood covenants. The first um, blood covenant bound you to the mob. So explain about that night back in 1975 when you took the oath and then you entered into this blood covenant where you obligated your life to follow a life of crime. Well, I had been, after I was proposed, I had been in like a recruiting period for about a year and a half where I had to prove myself worthy. Um, and I had to do anything I was told to do to, uh, to prove myself worthy and gain, you know, entry in that life. And then it was Halloween night in the States in 1975 when I was called into a room with five other gentlemen. That night we all took that oath. And I took the oath very seriously back then. I take it seriously today even though I don't consider myself a member of that life anymore. Because when you come into that life, you don't sign a contract. There's no retirement age. They say when you leave it, either leave in a coffin or join the government and enter a witness protection program. Obviously, I've done neither, but it was, um, you know, the mob is, is not a business. It's a way of life. It's a whole subculture from everything else that exists. And when you take that oath, you got to be in it all the way, body, mind, and soul. You don't survive. So that night was extremely serious for me. You know, I walked into a room and the boss, uh, you know, cut my finger. Some blood dropped on the floor. I cupped my hands, he took a picture of a saint, the Catholic altar card, put it in my hands and lit it aflame. And he said, tonight, Michael Francis, you are born again into a new life until the Cosa Nostra, this thing of ours. Violate what you know about this life, betray your brothers, and you will die and burn in hell like the saint is burning in your hands. That's the oath. So, I mean, I took that very seriously back then. Um, it was an idealistic view I had of being part of that life, part of what my father was part of, we were bound, you know, in blood in another way. And so it meant everything to me at that point in time. And I was, you know, 24 years old when I took that off. Now, um, you, you say that although the Lord Jesus was known to you at that time, that you chose to give the authority of your life over to the crime boss at that time. Was giving your life over to the crime boss surrendering? Did you find that difficult back then? Um, in some ways, but in other ways, I knew that this is what was required of me. So I knew how to accept authority. You know, I knew that, and uh, I knew I had to toe the line. 
you know, in that life, uh, you got to play by the rules or you don't survive. So, um, you know, my dad brought me up that way, and I had the best teacher in the world as far as I was concerned. My father schooled me in that life and how to, you know, not only survive, but, uh, you know, then on my own I prospered. So, um, you know, there were times when I was upset with some of the things that went on, um, but you don't voice your, yourself at that point in time. You keep your mouth shut. Uh, but I saw a lot of things in my 20 years in that life that I knew were just not right. You are the youngest, richest mafia don in the United States. It's absolutely untrue. You're not the youngest or richest, or? I have, I'm not anything as far as organized crime, mafia. It's all untrue. Now, Michael, you um, moved up in the ranks pretty quickly in the life of organized crime, the Colombo family. You became known as the prince of the mafia, literally making hundreds of millions of dollars. Until there was a business venture that was in the film industry. And when you got involved there, you met someone. And I quote, this someone you met is where your love for her became more powerful than your love for your dad and the mob oath. Explain that. Well, you know, I had enjoyed some success in that life, obviously. And uh, I was appointed a captain of Capo regime. And uh, I became a major target of law enforcement. I was indicted several times. I had two federal racketeering cases, one brought on by Rudy Giuliani at the time. At least according to this complaint, uh, it would seem that Michael Francisi is unfortunately following in the footsteps of his father. And so, um, you know, I was doing well because I was beating all these cases. I was winning and I was making a lot of money. And uh, they were grooming me to be the boss or the underboss at one point in time. And um, then all of a sudden I make this movie and I meet this young girl on the set and um, I start to fall in love with her. And she was a young Christian girl and her mother was a very, very devout Christian. Now, honestly, their faith, um, I wasn't buying into it. But I respected them because I saw how real it was to them. And then what happened, you know, I'm starting to fall in love with this girl and I want her in my life. But I'm saying, you know, my life is a direct contradiction to what these two women believe. How is this going to work? And honestly, I didn't understand what was happening at that point. But my love for her was becoming stronger than the blood oath that I took, stronger than this lifelong bond I have with my dad, that I really wanted her in my life. And I knew to have her, um, I have to make some changes. And that's what really put it in my head to start to see how I can maneuver myself out of the life. Because you can't just say I quit. You know, it was, uh, it was a tough decision and it was a tough plan that I had to put in play to try to make that happen. Now, as I mentioned earlier, your, your life can be defined by two blood covenants. The first blood covenant back in 1975 bound you to the mob. But later on, there was a second blood covenant that brought you freedom. Tell us that story. Well, you know, I had, I had accepted Christ uh, through my mother-in-law and my wife, but quite honestly, at that point, it was self-serving. I wanted my sins forgiven. You know, my mother-in-law, hey, say a prayer, accept Christ, your sins will be, be forgiven. Well, I want some of that. You know, what do I have to do? But I didn't understand the surrender part. And my, my mother-in-law would tell me, wife, well, you have to surrender to Jesus. And I said, you know, I'm a mob guy. What do you mean surrender? You know, God helps those who help themselves. I couldn't process that part of it. And um, it was really one fateful night for me when it was the first time in my life I ever experienced hopelessness. And I can tell you right now, it's the worst emotion as far as I'm concerned that you can ever experience. And I've felt everything from ecstasy right down to grief. But um, I was broken. And it was because I had, as part of my exit strategy, I had accepted a plea, got a 10-year prison sentence, I did five years on the 10, I got out, I was on parole, violated my parole and went back in. And the government was very upset with me. They were trying to turn me into a major witness and I was resisting. So when they violated me and put me in, they really, really took everything I had. And that first night in that jail cell, I was in the, I was in the hole, six by eight, and I was just afraid of the loss of everything dear to me. I said, my wife, she waited for me five years. She was 21 years old when we got married. Uh, 13 horrible months on parole. We really had a rough time. You know, people after me, it was, it was tough. I said, we had two little babies. Now I'm back in prison. She's 27 years old. I'm going to lose the girl I did all of this for. And um, I said, they can't put me out on the yard, you know, contract on my life. When I walked away, my own father turned on me at that point. 
And I said, and the feds are never going to put me out on the yard because they're going to not take responsibility if something gets, happens to me. So I said, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in this six by eight cell. At the age of 39, I'm done. It's over. And for the first time in my life, I didn't have an answer. And you know, it was just the fear of, of the loss of everything that was dear to me. And uh, it was a prison guard that slipped the Bible. He came by my cell. He said, Francis, you don't look good. You know, he looked in and I said, get away from me, man. Of course I don't look good. I don't want to see any of you guys. I chased him. Came back about a minute later. He pushes a Bible through the slot on the door. It fell on the floor. I heard this thump. And actually, I, got, I saw the Bible. I got mad. I jumped off the cot, picked it up, slammed it against the wall. And then I said to myself, you know what? I believed in God. I said, there's only me and God in this cell. I got nothing but enemies tonight. I don't need another enemy. And I picked up the book, and it was the first time in my life that I, I just looked up at that cement ceiling, and I said, God, if you're really up there, give me something to make me feel better, because I can't deal with this. I'm having a hard time. And you know, I didn't know how to read the Bible. You know, in Catholic school, we read the catechism. We don't read the Bible. The priest reads it from the pulpit on a Sunday. So I'm holding a Bible. It just falls open to the book of Proverbs. And uh, I started reading Proverbs, and this becomes a long story, so... All I can tell you is, it was that night that I challenged God. I really said to him, God, I trusted my father. I took a blood oath. I said, I've made two bad decisions. Look where it got me. I said, I can't accept you at this point in time. You've got to prove it to me. You've got to show me evidence. And evidence was obviously a major part of my life. And uh, that's when the things started to happen to me that night. Now, it didn't happen overnight. I spent three years in a hole, mm -hmm. six by eight cell, 24-7. Very, very difficult, no matter what anybody tells you. I, I learned through that experience, we, were me we weren't meant to be solo. We were meant to be social creatures. But during that time, I don't know if there's anybody on earth that studied the Bible as much as I did, because I had nothing but time on my hands, 24-7. I had my wife send me in more books on every religion that you can Im imagine, and I studied every faith. And I just came out of there after three years believing that the Bible was God's Word and Jesus was my risen Savior. Michael, you... Um Prayer is important for a follower of Christ, and you say if it wasn't for the prayers of your wife and your um, late mother-in-law that you wouldn't be here today. And Why is that true? My mother-in-law was the most godly woman I ever met in my life. Very simple woman, never hit me over the head with the Bible, but she was a prayer warrior. She believed so strongly in the power of prayer, and that woman prayed for me day in and day out from the first time she met me. And I believe she prayed me to where I am. I mean, I was sitting in a, in a room with her. I had just met her. And out of nowhere, she had a prayer book. And she used to put names in the prayer book. And she didn't even have to know your name. The boy on a street corner with one shoe. Just if she thought you needed prayer, it goes in the book. And she'd sit on her little porch, because she was, they weren't wealthy at all. And she'd pray. And uh, early on in my relationship with her, I was sitting with Camille. We weren't married yet. And she looked at me and she said, you know, I have a feeling that you're going to be preaching to millions of people. You're going to be sharing the gospel with millions of people at some point in your life. And I looked at her like, you know, is this woman on crack or something? I mean, I thought she was nuts. I looked at my wife. My wife, I never forget, she wasn't my wife yet, but she said, Ma, please don't scare him. I'm hoping for a Bible study, maybe church on Sunday. And you know what my mother-in-law's answer was? I'll never forget. She said, why would you limit the power of God in anyone's life? I'm going to pray for this man every single day. And I believe with all my heart, she prayed me through every struggle and every challenge. She's gone now. She's with the Lord, no doubt. But um, I believe in the power of prayer through her. One final question. You, um, you believe that you're a truly blessed man today. Why do you believe that? Look, I should be dead or in prison for the rest of my life. It's what I deserved. It's what I earned. You spent 20 years on the street every day in violation of both God's laws and the laws of man. There's no way to sugarcoat it. That's what it is. And it became so evident to me over the past 20 years that if God didn't have a different plan and a purpose for my life, I wouldn't be here. I'll give you some information that should open the eyes of people. The night that I got made, I took the oath. There were six of us that night. I'm the only one alive today. None of those five men died of natural causes. Every one of them were murdered. We had a big war in our family in the early 90s. I think 13 guys got killed. About 29 went to jail for life. I'd have been in the thick of that. Aside from that, Fortune magazine, 1986, they write this big article, 50 biggest and most powerful 
mob bosses in the country. They actually had a chart with the 50 of us on there. I was one of the six guys that they featured. I was number 18 on a list. I was five behind Gotti, my friend at the time. I was the youngest guy on a list. And, um, and I thought that was a silly list. How did they, you know, they didn't ask for our tax returns. But what isn't silly about that list is some 31 years later, out of the list of 50, 47 of those men are dead. Two of them are doing life in prison without parole, and I'm here speaking to you. Mm -hmm. And I could have been one of them for sure. But God had a different plan. He navigated this course for me, and nobody can tell me any different. Mm -hmm. And I believe it with all my heart. Michael, thank you so much for sharing the grace of God in your life and your story with us here today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.